Bismillah, min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa ala alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin Please recite the salawat Allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ala muhammad wa ajjil farajahum Once again before we start tonight I just want to emphasize the importance of these nights that we're going through together and to understand uh, or to underline the importance of these nights. Uh, last night I mentioned a very important sentence from one of the ulama or one of the onofa that lived in Iran a couple years ago or more than a couple years ago actually. Um, but it's interesting how our ulama when it comes to Imam al Hussein and anything basically that has to do with the love and affection of the Imam it's basically hands down meaning that the words of the ulama and the teachings of the ulama is this that whatever you can do in this regard Bismillah whatever you can do if what you can do means standing outside and I don't know guiding the, the cars coming inside Bismillah that, that's valuable if what you can do is helping out inside, then that's valuable. If you can help with the ilmi aspect of it, the intellectual aspect of it, Bismillah. If you can't do anything, you can't do anything. Hmm? But what you can do is you can wear black. You can wear black and be a cause of the upholding of this majlis. How? Because when you come to this majlis, it creates a gathering. Hmm? Maybe you're not the type of person or I'm not the type of person that would come here to necessarily cry for the Imam. Maybe I've sinned so much that my heart, it's become hard. When they read the musibah, when I think of the musibah, I don't necessarily shed any tears. Hmm? But what I do is I wear the black, I show my grief, and because of that, a majlis is created, and through that majlis, others whose hearts are pure, whose hearts are not hard like mine, they come and cry. You're also sharing their thawab as well. Yes, that person is at a higher level than me, but I'm also taking part in this. The stories that you have, sometimes if you look into the stories of people who have just brought themselves a, a bit closer to Imam al Hussein and how Imam al Hussein has revolutionized their life. I remember there's this person that they, they mention his story a lot on the Manabir. His name was Rasul Turk. And he came basically from a Turkish uh, background and origin. And this person was the type of person that he was known for his fisq. He was known for his open sins. So one night he goes, he wants to take part in one of the majalis. I didn't intend to talk about this, it just, just came up. But one of the nights he goes to, intend to attend one of the majalis of Abu Abdullah. And because the majlis was in a neighborhood where they usually wouldn't accept these type of people, the person in, in charge of the majlis turns around and he says that, well, you know, this is the majlis of Abu Abdullah. This is the son of Fatima al-Zahra. Not anyone has the chance and the opportunity and the permission to enter this majlis. So the guy that's in charge of the majlis basically de declines. He says, you can't enter the majlis because you're, this, is, this is what you do on a daily basis. You're known for the sins that brings grief to the heart of Fatima Tazara. What are you coming here doing Aza for his son, for her son? So Rasul Turki leaves and he goes later on during the night, he feels really bad. And he says, oh, well, yeah, it is my actions that have caused such a thing that even if I want to go and cry for the Imam, people won't allow that. People would consider that an insult to the Imam. So he sleeps that night and he sees a dream. So does the person that didn't allow him to come into the majlis of Abu Abdullah. 
The person that didn't allow him, he sees a dream in which Imam Hussein comes to him and says, Why did you turn this person away from my majlis? You don't have that permission. Yes, if it's someone that's coming in, right, and he's disrespecting others, he's causing issues, that's a different thing. But someone like me, I have commit sins. I'm coming here to purify myself. I'm coming here to bring myself closer to Abu Abdullah so that Abu Abdullah will change me. What, you don't have the permission to turn that person away. So he wakes up in the middle of the night. He goes to the house of Rasul Turk. Rasul Turk is not asleep either. He's also had a dream. Rasul Turk also has a dream in which the Imam sees him as a servant of his. And he sees that he's standing at the tent of Imam al Hussein in Karbala in the form of serving the Imam. And he doesn't even see the Imam, he doesn't even talk to the Imam in the dream, and none, none of that happens. He just understands that the Imam has accepted him as his servant. And that's it. Rasulullah Turk goes on to be one of those people that's known not only in his neighborhood, not only in his city, but in all of, of Iran now, they know him as one of the people who had the greatest love and affection. And it wasn't just love and affection, yeah, Abu Abdullah, I love you, you know. No, it translated into actions. You know how difficult it is for someone who is addicted to certain sins? If you're addicted to them, if you have a habit of doing them, to turn away from them, and bring about a life that is pure, that's very difficult. And Rasulullah Turk was able to do that. And who is there to say that me or you tonight are not going to be Rasulullah Turk? Yes, I might not be like Rasulullah Turk who would openly sin, but I know what type of person I am. We all know what type of persons we are. Inna al insana ala nafsi basira. In the ins insan knows himself. He knows what's going on. We all know what, what type of people we are like. We know our flaws. No one is to say that if you're coming to the majlis of Abdullah, no, you're not going to be Rasulullah Turk. Rasulullah Turk was for Rasulullah Turk. No. It's not necessarily that the, that's not necessarily the case. No, maybe I'm going to be Rasulullah Turk tonight. Or tomorrow night. Or we never know. So let's not underestimate the importance of these, of these majalis. Um, I'm sure you've heard, I've, you guys have heard the traditions when it comes to the majalis of, Ab, uh, of Abu Abdullah. That yes, if, you, if someone cries the amount of a tear, such and such blessings, such and such forms of forgiveness of his sins, to the point where the Imam in a couple of traditions, he says, Man baka al tabaka. Tabaka means you make it look like you're crying. You're not crying. My heart is hard. I'm not crying for Abu Abdullah. Hmm? I'm qasiyul qalb. My heart is hard. I'm not crying for Abu Abdullah. But I know this much that I can make it look like I'm crying so that the majlis of Abu, of Abu Abdullah takes on a good form. Others who want to cry, they're able to cry. They're able to mourn for the Imam. Even that has some very incredible thawab, traditions that sometimes it blows your mind. Please recite a salawat. Please recite a second salawat. Alhamdulillah, he really likes the attention. <laughs> so, uh, these past two nights, we talked about a very important concept, and we'll inshallah continue to talk about this, to this concept and this topic. Last night, I think I went a bit uh, too long with the talk, and honestly, that rarely happens for me. Tonight, today, what I was thinking about, I was like, why, why did that happen? The only reason why I could come up with was this concept and these, the, this topic that I'm discussing because I've seen with my own eyes what it has done for the people around me 
because I've experienced it, not myself, but the people that I've seen around me, my friends. It's such an, a passionate, I have, it's so, I'm so passionate about this topic that sometimes I'll, get, I'll go a bit too long. I'm not used to that, but the passion I have for this topic, and it's not, it's not one of those, like one of those things that you say as a shawar, right? You say like, yeah, I'm very passionate about this. No, no, this is one of those things that of course I haven't been able to apply it too much, but my way of thinking is centered around this, this concept. And I've seen that those who were able to apply this in their lives, subhanAllah, when they, I mentioned this last night, when they walk into the room, you feel it. You feel it. It's interesting. One of the teachers of akhlaq that passed away just a couple years ago, uh, he was a student of Allama Taba Tabai. And so uh, the Hosea students would go to him every now and then because he had an akhlaq session. And I asked him, so what do you do when, wh or what did you used to do when you went to Allama Taba Tabai? Hmm? What questions did you ask? What, what kind of discussion did you have with him? And the scholar, he sit there um, and you basically say that nothing, we never really asked him too many questions. The only thing we did was we sat there and we watched Allama. We sat there and we watched Allama because Allama has done this with his life. He doesn't need to speak too much. Hmm? You just have to be in the presence of Allama and, you know, that's what his students need. So, if someone is able to apply this concept and work on it day in, day out, and months, and years, five years from now, ten years from now, he's going to be a totally different person. Not the same person, but at the age of 50. What do I mean by that? We went through this concept that as Muslims, generally speaking, we're not bad people. We usually do more good deeds than bad deeds. But because we're mixing it, we don't see the effect of those good deeds. Hmm? We're ruining it. What happens is at the age of 18, you look at yourself, say, I was generally a good person at the age of 18, but I, did some, I, I used to do some wrong things. When you reach the age of 50, you ask yourself the same question, what's your answer? It's the same answer. Generally speaking, alhamdulillah, I'm a good person. But, you know, I still have those things going on. And no one is saying it's easy. But no, we have to understand this is a priority, number one. And you have to work on it. We have to work on it. So that 50 years from now, they say, okay, wh where are you now? You don't say, yes, I'm generally a good person, but... Or if you do say that, but, it's a, it's, it's a lot less than it was 20, 30 years ago. Please just sign us on notes. So we mentioned a couple of points. We mentioned the viewpoint that Islam gives us pertaining to this world, pertaining to our desire for the unlimited, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this world in order for us to create the means of fulfilling this desire. Then we emphasize the importance of ubudiyah. We said if you want to fulfill that desire of yours, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, you can't do that unless you go through ubudiyah. What is ubudiyah? Ubudiyah means that you are an abd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way He wants you to be, not the way you want it to be. The way we want it to be, I want to come from Muharram and then afterwards do what I want to do. That's the way we want it. The way He wants you to be, He wants to be abdun mahd. Yes. That's the ideal situation. So that's where we're moving. It's not where we are. It's not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is expecting from us right now. No. Ya ayyuhal insan, innaka kadihun ila rabbik. You're going to struggle towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're going to strive. You're going to make effort. You're going to fall. So that's not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is expecting from us right now. No. But He's saying you have to, we have to head towards that direction. Okay. Let me just mention, yesterday we mentioned that the thing with bad deeds is that it ruins the good deeds. It weakens our iman. And we said that when we look at our good deeds and our bad deeds, we cannot look at it as stacking up points. 
right? Where you do minus and plus and you end up with something more than zero and you feel like, yes, I've become a better person today. No, we said that you are building a structure. You're building faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you want to build faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have to look at it as the example we gave, where you're building a structure, but at the end of the day, you take out the, bri the brick at the bottom. What happens? The structure is going to fall. I'm going to go through uh, three or four verses of the Qur'an. These are verses of the Qur'an that truly s scare me when I, go, when I hear them or I talk about them. Because this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about His Prophet. And when we're talking about the Prophet, we're talking about the person that is basically the best friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? It's the closest person to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's Habibullah. So if you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking in a serious tone with this person, then the rest of us need to get things together basically. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just explaining what would happen if this prophet of ours committed a sin. A'udhu billah min ash-shaytan rajim walau taqawwala alayna ba'da al-aqawil Taqawwul means to say something or attribute something to someone when he hasn't said it. وَلَوْ تَقَوَّلَ عَلَيْنَا بَعْدَ الْأَقَاوِيلِ If this Prophet of ours was to ever attribute things to us that we had not said. Hmm? Make up things of his own. لَأَخَذْنَا مِنْهُ بِالْيَمِينَ We would get him firmly. ثُمَّ لَقَطَعْنَا مِنْهُ الْوَتِينَ and we would cut his vein. And if this, was, if this wasn't the wording of the Qur'an, I would never dare say something like this. لَأَخَذْنَا مِنْهُ بِالْيَمِينَ ثُمَّ لَقَطَعْنَا مِنْهُ الْوَتِينَ فَمَا مِنْكُمْ مِنْ أَحَدٍ عَنْهُ حَاجِزِينَ And none of you guys, your companions, how many companions does the Prophet have? Millions. None of you would be able to stop us. If we intended to do such a thing, doesn't matter how many companions he has, doesn't matter how many people know him, how many people praise him, how many people send their salutes to him. No. If we wanted to do this, you couldn't stop us. So what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying? He's saying when you're committing that sin, you're not amongst the friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you're committing the sin. Yes, when you repent later on, that's a different issue. But when you're committing the sin, you're not amongst the friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. ثُمَّ لَقَطَعْنَا مِنْهُ الْوَتِينَ No. So, to think that if I do this good deed and then I do this bad deed, these two are just going to work out together and they vanish. It doesn't work like that. Because when you commit a sin, for that amount of time that you are busy doing that sin, you are amongst the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you repent, yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives you, but the iman that returns to you is not the same. The same way, I like to give this example, the same way sometimes when you and I, if we have a friend, we have a very close friend, someone that has relied on us for years and we have relied on them for years. If I were to betray that friend of mine, if he's really a good friend of mine, he'll forgive me. Hmm? If he really has si'ay sadr, if he's really the type of person, is a forgiving person, he'll forgive me. But the question is, is your relationship, your friendship, is that going to be the same after? No, that's damaged. Now you have to work for another 20 years to make up for that friendship. Of course, that's when we're talking about human beings. Right? Alhamdulillah, our God is more merciful than that. We don't have to work 20 years because of one sin. But the point is that once you commit that sin, you've already damaged your friendship with Him. You've already damaged your relationship with Him. You've already damaged the nur that you had gotten from the good deeds that you did. Yes, 
You repent, alhamdulillah, but that's not enough, it's too late. Hmm? So you have to reach a point, and I have to reach a point where we don't go through that, where we don't ruin our good deeds with this haram. Please decide a salawat. I'm going to go through one more tradition and then we're going to move on. This tradition is from Imam Sadiq Salawatullahi and he's narrating what Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is saying. This again just to give you an idea of what it is when we're committing a sin. He says this is about bothering another believer. Hmm? It's as if you are declaring war against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you bother a believer of his. He says, you, you're bothering a believer of mine? I will give permission that people go to the battlefield with you. So if I'm sitting here and I bother one of the believers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I can't, I can't claim in that moment that I am amongst the friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, 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 you are amongst the enemies right now. Yes, if you repent, you go back, but the relationship is not the same thing. Now we're going to go through a very interesting tradition. And whenever I go through this tradition, it brings a smile to my face. Uh, that puts into perspective what exactly we mean when we are talking about the difference between stacking up points when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and building faith with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Building Iman with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. This is once again the sixth Imam. The sixth Imam, he's trying to explain the status of someone who thinks that he is following the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who thinks he's following Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's command, but he's really yattabi'u hawa. He's following his own hawa, his own desire. He says, This person, the person who follows his own desires. It's like this person that, and this is where the story starts, it's like the person that I heard a lot of people praising. The Imam is saying, I heard a lot of people praising this particular person in the city and I heard so many great things about him that I became curious to understand what is this person doing that everyone is saying such great things about him and we know that if you look back into history when it came to our Imams people did not know our Imams as an quote-unquote Imam no the majority saw them as what good people right they saw oh, Ja'far ibn Muhammad I know him he's a good person He's a knowledgeable person. Afqahun nas. He's the most knowledgeable. But is he an imam? Does he, has a, a, does he have authority over you? No. That's, that's a different issue. So the imam says, I followed this person. One day I went to the bazaar, the market. And I wanted to see what it is that everyone is so fascinated by the characteristics of this individual. So he says, I went to the market and I saw him. And, but, I, but I was standing far away and right when he entered the market, people, there was a hashd. People were all around him basically asking, you know, meeting him, asking questions because he was now very famous. So the Imam says I was standing far away just waiting to see what this person is going to do with his life basically today. So he says as I was standing there, little by people, little by little people started leaving. And this person was now on his own. So he started moving in this market, in this bazaar. And as he was moving in this bazaar, there were people, obviously the bazaar people are selling things. So there's one person selling bread, right? He had a basket with loaves of bread in it. And he's calling out bread, bread, like they sell things in the bazaar. And while he wasn't paying attention, this man took two loaves of the bread and he put it in his pocket. 
And so for a second, the Imam says, Ta'ajabtu, I didn't know what was going on. Is he stealing? Is he not stealing? But the reaction of the Imam is, he says, La'allahu mu'amala, maybe there's some sort of a transaction between them. Maybe there's some sort of an agreement between them. Hmm? Maybe I don't know what's going on. So he doesn't jump to conclusions. We'll talk about this inshallah. Jumping to conclusions when it comes to others is one of those sins that we are not aware of. Some sins we're very aware of. Right? The example I gave yesterday. Sometimes you're walking down the supermarket, there's an aisle for certain things that are haram. Right? Shaitan is not going to come to you in front of your whole family and tell you, oh, brother such and such, why don't you have some pork tonight? He's not <laughs> Shaitan doesn't want you to have pork. He's not even worried about that. What he's worried about is making you think that if you don't have pork, then everything else that you're doing is fine. That's what he's worried about. That's what he's concerned about. The Prophet, he was explaining the importance of sitting in the masjid and just being present in the masjid. And he says that every person that is sitting in the masjid, it's as if he's doing ibadah, even if he's not doing that. It's as if he's doing ibadah. Unless there is a hadath, unless uh, or up until the point, yahduth. And they ask him, what is this hadath? He said, when he does ghibah. When you're sitting there in the masjid, shaitan wants you to know that you're sitting in the masjid. He's not a con that's not what he's concerned about. Hmm? That's not what he's concerned about. Yazid also went to the masjid. La'anatullahi alayhi. But... What shaitan is concerned about is making you and I think that if we didn't have pork today, if we didn't have alcohol today, if we didn't kill anyone today, that everything else is fine. We're a good Muslim. So some sins, they're, very, they're not that obvious. Jumping to the conclusions when it comes to others, judging others is one of those. Of course, there's a detailed discussion that we'll probably have later on. But now going, c c continuing with the, with the story. So he says, I saw this person take the loaves of bread and he put it in his pocket. And me out there seeing this, I said, no, maybe there's some sort of a transaction and an agreement. I'm going to move faster. And so he continued to move through the bazaar. He came across someone who's selling pomegranates. Hmm? And he was calling out, Roman, Roman, or... Pomegranate, pomegranate, if he speaks English, I don't know. And while he wasn't paying attention, he took two of the pomegranates and he put it in his pockets. Hmm? So in one pocket he has two loaves of bread, and in the other pocket he has what? He has two pomegranates. So he says, I continued following him, and all of a sudden, once again I was surprised, because he passed by this poor person, and he gave the two loaves of bread to the poor person. Moves forward. He takes out the pomegranates, gives it to another poor person. So the Imam then continues following him until he leaves basically the bazaar and he reaches the outskirts of the city. And the outskirts back then were like deserts, right? So he says, that's when I confronted him. And if you allow me, I'm just going to read off of the tradition here because it's very interesting what he says to the Imam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad. So the Imam says, I asked him, what's going on? If you could please explain, because I'm very surprised at what you are doing today. فَقَالَ لَهُ لَعَلَّكَ جَعْفَرُ بْنُ مُحَمَّدٍ Maybe you're this Ja'far that they're talking about, the grandson of the Prophet. فَقُلْتُ بَلَى Yeah, that's, that's me. And he turns around to the Imam and he says, فَمَا يَنْفَعُكَ شَرَفُ أَسْلِكَ what good does your lineage do? What good does the fact that you descend from the Prophet do for you when you're ignorant, when you haven't read the Qur'an? So the Imam's next question is, what, what, what verse are you talking about? What part of the Qur'an is telling us to, or telling you to do such a thing? He says, aha. Uh -huh. قَالَ قَوْلُ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ مَنْ جَاءَ بِالْحَسَنَةِ فَلَهُ 
وَمَنْ جَاءَ بِالسَّيِّئَةِ فَلَا يُجْزَى إِلَّا مِثْلَهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an He says If you are able to bring a good deed I will multiply the reward How many times? Ten times وَمَنْ جَاءَ بِالسَّيِّئَةِ فَلَا يُجْزَى إِلَّا مِثْلَهَا But when it comes to punishment I will only show you the punishment of the action itself Nothing more So He says you are the grandson of the Prophet why don't you know about this verse? Because I took, and this is all explained in the tradition, he actually does the math in the presence of the Imam. He says, I took two loaves of bread, and I took two pomegranates, and that's minus four. And then I gave all four as charity, and that's what? Plus 40. So he does the math for the Imam. And he says, well, we end up with plus 63, or 36. So I'm making progress. And the Imam says, no, no, you're missing a point here. This is what happens when one does not refer to the Ahlul Bayt when it comes to understanding the Qur'an. Things like this happen a lot. He says, no, you're missing out on something else. He says, what is it? He says, you haven't heard this verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he's explaining the story of Adam and his children that one of them made the sacrifice and the other one didn't or the other one also did but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only accepted the sacrifice of one of them what does the verse say? قَالَ إِنَّمَا يَتَقَبَّلُ اللَّهُ مِنَ الْمُتَّقِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only accept the deeds of those who have taqwa what does taqwa mean? Is that when it comes to a haram at least, at the very least you try your best to stay away from it. Not that you're just okay with it. Yeah, I did 10 good deeds today, so I have coupons for two bad deeds today. That's the way we see it. We laugh at it, but that's how we see it. This is how this person is seeing it. He's seeing it as points. I did these, so now I have some extra points that I can waste. But that's not how the Imam sees it. The Imam says, listen, you have to be amongst the muttaqeen for those good deeds to be accepted. Hmm? So what we need to do, brothers and sisters, and I'm wrapping up, what we need to do, brothers and sisters, is stop these good, leads, good deeds from leaking. We and you, me and you, we need to stop the leak. If you're able to stop the leak, these good deeds will stack up so much that you will be a totally different person. When it comes to Salat, you won't feel like, oh, I have to push myself to get up for Namaz. Right now, me and you, we're at that stage. Hmm? If me and you are able to carry on with this path, that won't be the case. Some of our ulama, they took so much pleasure in Salat. One of the ulama, he took so much pleasure in his Salat, that at the end of when he was passing away, he said, you know what, I have to make up for my salat. He said, how many? He was a great alim. He said, how many? Like, they're, they're guessing at if he has to make up for anything. It's like one or two, right? He said, no, I have to make up for the whole thing. The whole thing? We thought you're a good person. He says, no, the thing is, I took so much pleasure in praying that now I'm not sure whether I was praying because of, I, because of the pleasure or because that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told me to pray. Now that's a very ideal situation, right? Now I'm just mentioning that just for us to understand that this prayer that we pray, yes, right now it's very difficult and that's totally natural. But that's, if someone is able to carry on with this path year after year after year, after five years, after ten years, he reaches a point where he takes pleasure in praying. So, I don't want to go further than the time that we have tonight. Inshallah, tomorrow night, um, we're also going to explain the importance of the mustahabbat. We say that, okay, focus on, the, on refraining from the haram. That's basically the concept that we're trying to get across. That you need to focus on staying away from the muharramat. If you do that, the mustahabbat will come themselves. So, Shaykh, what are you saying? You're saying mustahabat aren't important. You're saying, you're saying that Salat al-Layl isn't important. No, 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 no. If someone continues on this path, 
he will reach a point where missing his Salat al-Layl will be like a sin for him. But brothers and sisters, we have to start at the bottom. There's no, you can't jump, you can't take shortcuts. Maybe in the schooling system here, in the States you can take, you can jump. But no, spiritual, when it comes to spiritual, you have to start at the bottom. The bottom is, you have issues, you have flaws, you have to take care of those harams. Inshallah, we're going to explain more about this tomorrow night. And also, the results that come about. When someone is able to apply this into their lives. One of it is taking pleasure in speaking with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's one of it. But there are many others that we'll go through, inshaAllah. Sallallahu alayki ya Aba Abdullah. Tonight is the night that they usually speak of one of the companions of the Imam who went through a very interesting course. during these nights and coming closer and closer to the night of Ashura and to the day of Ashura. And that is no one but this great companion of the Imam Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi. And we know the story of Hur of how on the day of Ashura he comes to the tents of Imam al Hussein and he joins Imam al Hussein and he asks for, give, for forgiveness for Imam al Hussein. But the thing that has always been something that brings sad and grief to myself is how Hur felt after Imam al Hussein had forgiven him. After Hur had come to Imam al Hussein and said, Ya Imam, I'm sorry for what I did. I want to be amongst your companions. The Imam is, he's an Imam. He's going to forgive you. But subhanAllah, I don't know how Hur was able to take those moments up until he was martyred. Because just a day before, he could see that these children are thirsty. He could see that these children are calling out, Al-Atash, Al-Atash. Oh uncle, we need your water. Oh Abbas, we need your water. Hur could see all of this. Just a day ago, he could see the sadness that Lady Zainab had. The sadness that Sukaina, that Ruqayya had. Now he's coming back. To be with Imam al Hussein, great, Imam, the Imam is going to forgive him. But I don't know how Hur is going to stand there near the tents of Abu Abdullah. To stand there and hear the crying of Ali Asghar. How is he going to stand there in the front of Imam al Hussein while Ali Asghar is crying out, asking for water in his own way? How is Hur going to stand there while the Imam sees Qasim walking in front of him, knowing that this Qasim, he's not even his son. Now things have become so difficult that the Imam is willing to give the son of his brother in, in order to defend the Haram of Rasulullah. The only thing that I hope brothers and sisters is that on the Day of Judgment, when Imam al Hussein comes and it's now time for us, for our actions, for Imam al Hussein to take account for our actions and say, okay, are you, were you amongst our companions or not? I don't know, brothers and sisters, how we're going to stand in front of him and say, you lost your asghar to the arrow that struck his throat. And I wasn't there for you, but now, please forgive me, Ya Imam. Now, I'm, I'm here for you. 
They say that Hur was the first one to go to the battlefield. And what else could Hur do? If you are Hur, if you are free, as Hur's mother had named him, you're going to be the first one to go to the battlefield because you cannot stand the crying of the six-month-old. You cannot stand the sadness and the grief of Umm al-Masaib Zainab. You cannot sa stand the, the grief that the Imam has deep down knowing that his Akbar has to go because of you. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't place us amongst those who are going to be ashamed in the presence of Imam al Hussein? Ala la'anatullah ala al qawm al dhalimin wa sayya'alamu al ladhina dhalamu ayyamun qalabin yan